then I remember. All right. Oh, so, so we're going to we're going to start with Aiden and the current event. Okay? Garrick. Okay, come sit here, Aiden, yep. so that they can see you I'm and hear you. My second one. So did you have the guidelines? Or did you just do it? Okay, go ahead. Aiden, we have yep. a short amount of time. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll start with my media one because that's the less confusing. Okay. Um, alrighty. On March 30th, 2016, a series of tornadoes ripped through parts of Oklahoma. The city of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, said that many roads were closed and that policemen and fire crews were going house to house looking for injuries. So far, there have been seven cases of major injury. The National Storm Prevention Center predicted that 9 million people throughout parts of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas were in an enhanced area of risk. There are still currently flash flood warnings and severe thunderstorms predicted to continue. Alabama forecasters expect tornadoes with up to 70 mile per hour winds and quarter sized hail. Occurrences such as these make one thing of days such as the as Americans experienced during the Dust Bowl, which lasted from 1934 to 1940, roughly. That series of major droughts and famine killed thousands of Americans and greatly affected the American economy. These storms in Oklahoma and its surrounding states are nowhere near to the magnitude of storms experienced in the Dust Bowl, but they still affect Americans' life in harsh manners. Obviously, technology and early warning systems greatly reduce the probability of the U.S. experiencing as harsh of a weather strike as the Dust Bowl, but it is interesting to see just how far the nation has improved. Within minutes of the tornadoes and flash floods occurring, emergency response teams were closing off roads and getting people out of harm's way. If the tactics of early warning and response teams available today were used on occasions such as the Mississippi River Flood of 1927 or the Johnstown Flood of 1889 or even the more recent Mississippi Flood of 1993, then the loss of American lives would have been greatly reduced. To see these differences makes one aware of the advantages they have in today's times and makes them more thankful. Great. Okay. Comments or questions? Thumbs up. It was a series of them. It wasn't just one giant tornado. Um, it was, like I read, it was one of them. It was kind of one tornado that kind of hit and then kind of went back up into the clouds and then hit again. And so. Which I think is common for tornadoes. Mm -hmm. Not that I've lived in tornado country. And then there were flash floods all over the place and um, seven major or critical injuries so far. I'm sure plenty of other minor injuries. And when did this happen? 30th yesterday. Okay. So, or at least that's when the article was. I could not, I tried to like confirm when exactly it happened. Um, but I couldn't find the exact date of the storms so i'm guessing it was the 30th because that's when it hit the news so okay and then the there's all sorts of flash flood warning going up through seven o'clock today um if it did hit yesterday because it said on wednesday and then it said warnings through thursday so currently as in right now there's still flash flood warnings and yeah all that going on so no deaths, only not yet. Injuries? Not not in this article not I found. That not that I found, but at that time, um, seven major cases, a uh, few few of them critical. But I would imagine. So far, not any deaths. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, Did it affect the really? As far as I could tell, it was only urban, but they they had a map, and um, I don't know that geography well enough to say yes or no whether it affected agriculture, but on the article, there was a map of, like, 
flash flood warning and then flash flood possibility areas. Um, it was a pretty big area. I mean, Nine million people are possibly affected by it. In Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, parts of Texas, Louisiana, throughout that whole that region. Whole so it's not just Oklahoma. Let's see, I had it in here. Okay. Where, where the states are, yeah. But Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. Okay. All right. So. Great. Alrighty. And then the legislative one. This is the one that's not as close to the problem just because I didn't tie in the legislation, but I will do that. Okay. So. In 2011, John Oliver was issued a 90-day visa during the time his wife was dying. He overstayed that visa as a result, and as a result was banned from entering the United States for 10 years. Now, only five years since the occurrence, he is allowed to return to the U.S. John Oliver is a World War II veteran who was a bomber navigator, and because of his service, lawmakers pressured the State Department to make an exception in Oliver's case. Six months later, Oliver was granted a conditional parole, which was renewable every two years. The whole ordeal began in October of 2011, when John Oliver and his wife went to visit their son in New Jersey from their home in the Bale, Bailewick, New Jersey? I'm not sure. Bailewick? Bailewick. New was Jersey? Of Jersey. No, it's um from Britain, Great Britain, it's okay. over there, so. Bailewick? Of Jersey, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. They had planned on returning home after their three-month visa expired, but because of John's wife's health, they were unable to travel. Because of their inability to travel, John Oliver's son, Robert, Robert Oliver, and his fiance had to quickly try to secure green cards for the elderly couple. They were not able to get the cards, but they had, but John Oliver and his wife were not punished by immigration officials. They were told that it was an easy case and that they should not worry. In the meantime, John's wife died in hospice care, hospice care, and John and his son were still desperately trying to secure a green card for John Oliver because of his declining health, but they were continually rejected. Despite that John Oliver had paid U.S. taxes as well as $70,000 in medical bills, as soon as he boarded a flight home in 2013, he was banned from the U.S., now, after a somewhat freak occurrence, the family was able to contact the governor through a radio talk show, who was appalled that John Oliver was never able to gain his, who was never able to grant his green card. Now, with the help of Senator Booker, John Oliver is allowed to return to the U.S. This relates to U.S. United States history in a couple of ways. For one, it shows how much people today are appreciative of those who fought during times like World War II. The fact that New Jersey Senator Cory Booker and Governor Chris Christie pressured the state in John Oliver's case shows the impact of one man's action years ago have on society today. Another interesting way it relates to history is the difference getting into America is. During colonial times, just about anybody could move to the Americas without any opposition. In fact, people wanted as many people as possible to move. Even after the colonies became the United States of America, immigration was not as difficult as it is today. Makes one think of the question, is the change good? <laughs> and obviously the legislation I'm trying to tie into this is immigration laws. That. Okay. All right, questions, comments? <laughs> oh, nobody wants to get into that discussion? Oh, oh yes. Okay. You said Senator, Bo Senator Cory Booker, right? Yep. He's pretty amazing, actually. He's done actually a lot of things for actually a lot of people. When people like email him, I watched a thing on him on Bill Mal with Bill Mallory. If you like email him, he actually like personally gets back to you, and he'll actually like you know look into your cause. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yep. In the article, it said that um, he Senator Booker like personally oversaw the whole um, 
like he was involved through the entire ordeal of getting John Oliver back to the U.S. So he was part of getting getting the permission and the flights and everything. And um, mm-hmm. Governor Christie um, sent letters of support for Oliver to the State Department, and um, with uh, he he also assisted in the flight back to America. Okay, so is John Oliver a citizen of the United States? Is his wife a citizen? His wife died. I had that in there. Yes, yeah. but um, if he fought in World War II, he fought for the British or did he fight for the U.S.? I'm I, guessing for the British. It didn't say in here, but um, I'm guessing for the British because that's where he lived. But it... um. I mean, it was something Somebody America was involved in. Somebody who's a British citizen, sounds like. So he was here right. on the 90 day visa and it expired because his wife was ill. And. They were not, she was not able to travel because of her conditions. Yeah. And so. And then he couldn't travel. Yeah. Okay. And well, he, he could, but I mean, his wife just died here. He's got all these medical bills, and so he's trying to get a green card so he can stay here, because then all of a sudden his health goes down the drain. So he's, okay, now he wants to stay with his son and fi- his fiance, um, But they, because they weren't able to get it in 2013, which I think I had, and I'm pretty sure I typed up, mm-hmm. he, okay, well, he and his son were going to fly back to his ho- home. But as soon as he was on that flight, they were like, you overstayed your visa. You can't come back for ten years. Yeah. But now, the senator and governor were able to argue his case, and he's able to come back. Mm-hmm. And in the article, it said that he paid ta- he paid U.S. taxes. Yep. So it's like he wasn't just staying I here. He paid. Yeah, that that's my yeah. confusion as to what kind of a citizen he is, and yeah. You know, does he have right. a business interest here? Is his, you know, does he own the home that mm-hmm. his son is living in? What? Because how, how is that connection? It's not like he was just living here illegally. I mean, he was, he was paying. He wasn't just that, um, taking advantage of the fact that he wasn't being punished. So it's a little. Well, if you're a British citizen, unless you're making money, you don't pay U.S. taxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, did, it didn't say there. Is it type of tax? Is the medical bills or is it? Cannot tax medical bills. You can also, from my um, <laughs> debt collection days, you cannot also charge interest on medical. <laughs> okay, a hospital cannot. Doesn't mean a doctor can't. And yeah. if you say that you're going to pay a dollar for a hospital bill for the rest of your life, they have to accept that at a hospital. So yeah, that's that's what was in the article, and so okay, that's what I found. All right. Um, so yeah, immigration laws. Those are that's Confusing. a hot topic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they I, did. I didn't involve it in my current event, but they did write a letter to Obama, <laughs> and it seemed the letter they got back. It was like, okay, did Obama write this, or is it kind of just sent to his office and his office replied? Because they got back a list of org- associations and organizations they should contact. <laughs> And he was like, and the letter said, yes, this is a hot topic, and but that was it. He didn't say, I can try to help. So that's what makes him think, okay, did, is this from Obama or is this from his organization? See, and that's where many people don't understand how it works. And in my experience, as working... In Senator Murkowski, Senator Frank Murkowski's office, and working with the legislative aides and the legislative staff, there are two kinds of staff. Basically, it's the staff that does the work of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. Of of any senator or representative, the staff is who you ask if you want to know what's really going on. The senators, they're, in my experience, is way too much information for them to understand know the details of every topic. Mm -hmm. Um, So 
Or like the president, it's the president, you have to think about how many, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're the president, how many letters you get like that, you know, from different people about, because our immigration system is so slow, that's why so many people just stay illegally or they overstay and they do it, it's just because they, they have, like there's a lot of, especially if you're Mexican, if you're Mexican or from any, actually from any of the Latin America, it takes for, like, you're, they don't, they only allow to, allow to uh, like, they're only allowed to allow so many in a year, and then, like, so a lot, a lot of them will have green cards, but then they'll overstay for their visas, or they'll overstay their visas, or they'll come over, and then they can't get a green card, so then they stay, and that's how they end up here for 20 years, and they'll keep having appointments or whatever, but they just are, it, our system is so slow and has so many things to go through, it takes forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult situation, and and those are the lucky ones, the ones who actually get in. Um, some of my friends work in as uh, front desk in the embassies, and the stories that they have uh, in Bangladesh. You know, how many people from Bangladesh actually make it to the United States when they come? There are hundreds that apply, thousands that apply, and next to none get in. Um, yes, Amber, question? Okay. Okay, so who would like to read the quote? I can't see it up on the screen. You can't see it on the screen, okay. Try again. Can you see it yet? Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Who'd like to read the quote? Want me to read it? Sure. save the remnants of the Jewish people of Europe for a new life and a new hope in the reborn land of Israel. Along with all men of goodwill, I salute the young state and wish it well. Wait, you guys know. Okay. So, um, how... Well, we'll get into a little bit about this uh, after World War II and the development of Israel. Um... Israel, of course, is in a, an area, a region of the world that is in constant flux. And so um, there's been controversy in that region from, I don't know, the beginning of time, pretty much. There's been controversy almost in every region since the beginning of time, but this region is particularly um, voracious. Okay, so we left off here. Um, is Brianna gone for the day? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we left here um, the photo of Auschwitz. That's the tiny gas chamber. That's not the big one. You're right. This is the tiny one. Um, and as I described, you can see scratch marks on the walls as you go through this. And I, again, I'm going to preface these slides with um, my own bias and my own experience um, because it was very, it was very emotional. Um, there are people who proclaim that the um, that the Holocaust never happened, and that these are basically American propaganda to uh, to dishonor the Nazis and the Germans. And um, my personal opinion is you can't walk through a concentration camp without being affected by what you see and and feel in in this. The clock officers are so 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty tough. So here's one of the walkways, and as I described, this is Auschwitz, and this was originally built. These were originally built as Polish Army uh, barracks, and so these brick buildings were transformed into areas where uh, the people that they kept alive in order to work were housed uh, in Auschwitz. There were also some where the experiments were being done. And this is one of the walkways. You can see the concrete um, fence posts, and that's all barbed wire. Every, every one of those, uh, you probably can only see dots on your screen, but every one of those is a line of barbed wire. And it curves in so you can't climb it. And actually there are also uh, electric, electrified. So this is Block 10 in Auschwitz. Has anyone heard of this? Block 10? Block 10 is where Karl Klauberg, who was the German physician, was a German physician, did experiments on women uh, to develop a method of sterilization on a mass scale. So he experimented on, on women most of them in Block 10 were Jewish, uh, but not all. If you were Catholic or homosexual or um, Polish, even some of the Polish. Okay, this is also Block 10. So you can see on the left the photograph of Block 10 where the women were. You can see that all of the windows have been closed, not just closed, but um, boarded over because the blinds would prevent the women from observing the prisoners. You can also see in front of the wall that there is a concrete uh, concrete slab and you might or might not be able to see it but there are holes in the slab and this is because um, this was called the death wall and this is where executions, some of the executions would be staged between block 10 and the next barracks over. Um, here's one of the guard towers with two sets of the electric fences, um, and you can see the electric fences on the on the far side as well. So you have electric fencing and barbed wire the entire uh, height of these of these fences. So this is obviously a halt sign, electrified right in front of the electrified fence, and it runs the entire perimeter of the camps. Okay, these are the train tracks that lead into the camp. Um, what's amazing about Auschwitz and, and that is it, it's almost like they walked, well it is, they kept it pretty much exactly the way it was left when the prisoners were liberated. Okay, and here's uh, Birkenau. Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz killed millions. Birkenau was built specifically to kill people. And so this is the front gate, the guard tower. You can see the train tracks that are going in. You can see um, in that entryway, you can see the uh, trees at the far end. This is called the, the gate of death. And they began building the camp in 1941. And this is like two miles from Auschwitz. And what they did is they moved people. There were farmers. It, there was a town there. They moved people far enough away that they didn't, they weren't, the regular people weren't allowed to come there. Um, you know, they'd have some deliveries. Most everything came in by train. Okay, so to try to keep people um, in the dark about what was going on. There are stories, however, of people um, wondering what the smell is, you know, you can see smoke and you can see and you can smell things from uh, coming from these camps. And then Birkenau, there were over 300 barracks that were constructed to house the prisoners. 
that were assigned to labor. Okay, so they didn't kill everybody. Uh, they would separate you, and you would um, be assigned either labor or you would be sent to the gas chambers. Some would go directly to the gas chambers, and some would be waiting. Here is um, here's a, a picture of the barracks. These barracks are actually where they, they were designed as horse stables. There are nine of them across in this row and ten deep. Okay, thousands, thousands of people were were in these barracks. It's the the size of this camp is staggering. All right. Um, and I think I have a picture on the inside of these, yes. Okay, so here's a picture of the inside of one of the horse stable barracks. You can see at the top um, where you would have glass, perhaps, but there was no glass here. So you can see the, the bunks, three high, uh, the length of these barracks. Um, and so people shared these bunks with strangers, whomever whomever they were. So there'd be three or four people per bunk on each set of bunks. Or, you know, three or four people on every level. All right. Um, this is the inside of some of the brick barrack bunks. Okay. And hundreds and hundreds of people would be in each one of these barracks. All right. And this is uh, the latrine. So for all the people who were in the camp, this is where you went. Um, there obviously is no privacy. So you can imagine also how cold it is in the winter because we were there in May and I was freezing. Um, it wasn't warm, right? It was probably in the 40s. It'd get up into the 50s or 60s, but it was, it wasn't warm. And, you know, you can imagine what it was like to, uh, these are concrete to use these. Here's another picture of the electric fence in the barracks. Uh, to the side you can see to the left you can see smokestacks and those are some of the brick barracks that they were able to uh, destroy as the um, allies were coming in. They tried to destroy some of the evidence before the allies got there when they knew the allies were coming in. Alright and here's one of the uh, roads between the barracks and there were six sections of barracks and you can walk through these but look look down at the end of this picture um, standing on one end of Birkenau and looking to the other end you can't see the people at the other end yeah it's it's phenomenal um, here is one of the guard towers and again, left as is, this one is one of the wooden guard towers um, overlooking some of the some of the barracks that they were able to destroy. Here's a picture of women and children. These women and children were heading directly to the death chambers. So if you were old, if you were determined uh, to be not of able body, if you were too young to work, then you were sent directly to the death chambers or to the, <clears throat> they'd separate you off of the train. And so if you were acceptable, you'd go one direction. If you were unacceptable, you'd go the other direction. And you can hear, you can see here one of the older women taking some of the, the kids. And so everything that they had in their suitcases in that were used, um, they would bring their suitcases, they would, uh, they would be parted with their, their items, and then the Nazis would go through them. So some of those buildings were full of suitcases, some of them were full of shoes, some of them were full of blankets, some of them were full of hair. Um, it's pretty, Amazing. Here's the remains of the crematorium at Birkenau. This, if you remember the uh, gate of death, if you look on the
far side and to the left of that, this is what they were. They tried to destroy it all, but they weren't able to, um, to take it all down before the Allies came in. They were going to work on restoring the crematorium so that you could see it. So um, this one, these were the ones that they actually tried to blow up um, to destroy the evidence. Okay, and here's a view from the crematorium to the gate of death. Right, so um, you can't see any person. You can barely see uh, the gate. Okay, any questions about Auschwitz or Birkenau? Miles and miles. Birkenau is much larger than Auschwitz. It's at least twice the size. I have a book on Auschwitz and Birkenau that I'll bring in when I bring in the historic facts. We bought that um, as we were there. And I think I, I explained in the last class where we, as we were going through these museums, as you walk through these, and I tried to only take pictures on the outside of the the buildings at Auschwitz because they did ask that you respect, um, you know, the people who died. So in these buildings, they're really large. Okay, here this kind of gives you a description. So they're three stories high, and as you walk through the hallways of these buildings that they're using as museums. There are photographs of all of the prisoners that came in because the Nazis were very meticulous, very detailed. They would use, um, they would use that. I mean, they, it was very well ordered, right? So they took a photograph of every one of the prisoners. Well, the photographs that they were able to use um, are lining all of these halls, the entire length of the halls, all three stories. And there were probably four tall, the entire length of the halls, both sides of the hallways, of people that had been killed. Um, they had all been shaved. And like I said, as you go through these museums, it describes some of the things that were found after the Allies um, came in and, and saw, the, saw what was going on. So you have... Uh, you know, and there's a suitcase with A. Frank on it, okay? Not the Anne Frank, but Anne Frank. There was another Anne Frank. Um, and blankets and baby shoes. Like, there's a whole room that they dedicated to baby shoes. And it's just literally mounded with that. And you walk through the, the one where there's the hair. And, and honestly, they kept the hair. Um, anybody know why they kept the hair? No, I was going to ask that stuff on. They use it um, in uniforms, like the uniforms. ships, uniforms, oh, the really, I was thinking maybe pillows. <laughs> and they may have done it for that too, but I, the ones that I've seen, the, uh, the U-boat captain's jackets were lined with hair as the insulation. And I have to say, it stunk. It did. Um, and you can tour some of the, you know, I, I think there were three buildings that we went in, and I, I just had to leave after we started into the description of some of the experiments that uh, they were doing on the children. Um, I was just done. I, it was just done. It was too much. It was way too much for me. So I did it. I watched, so I, like, I watched a couple documentaries on it, but there was one that where they really went into about, about the kids. Yeah, the same thing. I, I had to turn it off. It yeah. Too much. Yeah. It was, uh, whew, it was heavy. Um, but I recommend, if anybody's ever able to go, I recommend 
going and, and seeing it um, and determining for yourself whether you believe that it actually happened or didn't happen. Um, like I said, there are uh, there are critics of of this who say that the Holocaust never happened, that it is a hoax um, perpetuated by the United States government to put the Nazis um, in a bad light. So, all right, uh, moving on to the, any other questions? Any evidence of what? They have theories and they produce information that says that the United States government went in and created all of this. So they don't have any hard evidence. They're, they don't, yes, they, they really don't have a lot of hard evidence. There's, there's people that even that even said there's conspiracy on like Sandy Hook that say that Sandy Hook, the Sandy Hook shooting didn't even occur. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy on everything. Yes. Yes. All right, so then you have Auschwitz, you have the, um, you have Europe winding down. You still have the Pacific, right? And looking at the, the amount of time that it take, that it has taken to, um, to take some of these islands back and the amount, the number of people, uh, Americans who are dying in the Pacific, Truman is trying to mitigate the number of U.S. deaths, right? And so they have developed, with the Manhattan Project, they have developed uh, some bombs, and they're considering using them, okay? So leading up to this, you've got Iwo Jima, where 27,000 Marines were killed. Um, One-third of them, one-third of all the Marines that were killed in the Pacific were killed at Iwo Jima, okay? So tremendous uh, battles and deaths, right? Um, Okinawa was nearly impregnable Japanese defenses. There was a 35% casualty rate. It was higher than Normandy, all right? So really a lot of fierce, fierce fighting, right? So they're looking at these small islands and then they're looking at Japanese homeland and they're honestly looking at alternatives because for them to invade the Japanese homeland, it would be extremely difficult, and they're worried about the number of lives that it would cost, both on the Japanese and the American side, but, you know, coming from the U.S., they're worried mainly about the Americans, right? And not necessarily the Japanese citizens at this point. Uh, and Japan, the military leaders would not surrender, okay? You, it is against their honor to surrender. They are not surrendering in any of these instances. Whether they were outnumbered or not, they flat wouldn't surrender. Right? So, <clears throat> you have the Potsdam Declaration, which Japan refused to uh, engage with. And so, on 8-6 of 45, August 6 of 45, a B-29, Enola Gay, um, dropped the bomb, the first bomb, okay? And uh, on 8-8, eight, eight, Stalin declared war on Japan. The, um, the Japanese would not surrender even after the bomb. One thing that happened is that all communication was obliterated. So the Japanese government didn't even know what happened until they sent a plane to check uh, to check to see what was going on. And then the, the plane 100 miles out could see some of the dust in the cloud, right? But this was hours and hours after they dropped the bomb, right? And so on 8-8, Stalin declares war on Japan. As agreed, he was going to declare war after Germany surrendered. And then you have on 8-9, the bomb dropped in Nagasaki, okay? And after this, 
the emperor surrendered. The military leaders at this point still were considering not surrendering. Okay? Um, as they dropped the bombs, it was overwhelming, overwhelmingly dro um, backed in America to end the war and to shorten the war to save American lives. Please, let's just be done. Okay? And so there was overwhelming support to be done. Um, there are critics and have been critics from the very beginning as to whether the atomic bombs actually needed to be used. You know, was it too much? Was the civilian cost too much? Was the um, military, you know, was the cost too high? Um, if you recall, civilian casualties have been increasing throughout the war. You had carpet bombing, uh, you had the firestorms, right? Uh, Germany had bombed London, you had the Americans and, and Britain who were bombing Germany, um, carpet bombing, there were civilian casualties, uh, you have carpet bombing now um, in, in hydrogen atomic bombing okay so as as you look at this what really needed to happen um, some you know there are critics from both sides would the war have ended without possibly would the war have ended to our favor possibly would the war have ended to Stalin's favor since he's now uh, in the war in the, in Asia, would he have more influence in Asia now? You know, these are all questions that you can always play the game shoulda, coulda, woulda. You know, you can always look back and ask questions like this. Um, it's they're valid questions as we go forward and as you um, work, you know, and how you deal with situations forward. Okay, so. As World War II ends, you've got a global conflict where over half the world's peoples were involved, right? Um, there was fighting worldwide. There were navies on every single ocean, okay? So this was not just concentrated in one area, okay? 50 million people died during World War II, the estimates, okay? Over half of them were non-combat, non uh, combats, okay? The U.S., approximately 400,000 died. The USSR, take a guess on how many people died from the USSR. Keep going. 20. They're estimating 20 million people in Russia died in the USSR. Think of those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've just eliminated every major city in the United States in one fell swoop, right? <laughs> okay, um, China, 15 million. Significant, significant numbers that, um, you know, you look at today and, and it's just hard to comprehend that many people. Poland, how many people do you think from Poland died? Keep going. Less. Six. Six million people from Poland. Poland isn't that big. Okay. Um, Germany, four million people from Germany died. And Japan, two million people died. Okay. So you look at those numbers and you look at the wide variation of those numbers. I mean, think of that. 20 million from the USSR, two million from Japan. 400,000 from the United States, right? And so um, these are all questions and things to remember as we go forward as, as World War II sets the tone and the, uh, the thought pattern and especially the foreign policy for the United States and, and the rest of the world. And we're going to focus on, of course, the American foreign policy as it sets it to today's time. Right? I mean, we're still living with things. You saw the quote about Israel. We're still living with things from World War II, direct results from World War II. Okay, does everybody understand that? Okay.
So, <clears throat> you've got the little boy bomb, which was dropped over Hirosh Hiroshima. Um, this didn't even hit the city. It exploded above the city. Okay? As it exploded above the city, um, this is what it looked like, the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima. Um, about 300,000 civilians and about 43,000 soldiers lived there. It was an important military center. Um, and this is about 8.15 on a Monday morning. So it detonated 1,900 feet over the city. And nine out of ten people within a half a mile of ground zero were just gone. Literally ashes in most cases. Just gone. Everything. People, everything. Um, <clears throat> nearly every structure within a mile was obliterated. Um, within three miles, almost every uh, building had been damaged. So the, the force, the force of this bomb hit the Enola Gray as it was 100 miles out and the concussion. Okay? Um, the city was lit on fire and killed a lot of the rest of the people who had survived. It, the people had survived in that region for whatever reason. After the fire came in, most of them could get out. Okay? So... <clears throat> the relief, it took relief workers a long time to get into the city. They had some power again on the next day, uh, and they had rail service in, in two days, on August 8th, when what happened? What did the USSR do? Declared war. All right? The United States, nobody un really understood what had happened until the United States described what they had done on August 7th the day after, okay? Because nobody knew what kind of a bomb this nobody was. Nobody knew what kind of a bomb was. The people where these bombs were, were the atomic bombs, like the, the Bikini Atoll and the Marshall Islands, all these people are still living with the effects of us dropping these bombs, too. Yeah, yeah, those generations are, are certainly, and some of them are, you know, so, some of from World War II are still alive. Um, yeah. So, well, the problem with the problem with these bombs, the problem with these bombs is that the people, like their their children, and then their children's children, mm -hmm. are still having effects from the stuff from these nuclear bombs because of the radiation and stuff. Like, there's kids being born with three eyes and you know, right, three legs, just weird, weird stuff, right, from these bombs still. So, Right, and if you know anything of Japanese culture, um, they they wouldn't be the Ainu. The Ainu are the un, basically untouchable people in Japan, but they were um, disabilities aren't aren't seen the same way they are in the United States. Um, at least when I was there, if you were disabled, you were. Um, put aside, basically. Uh, it's not... I'm sure that it's becoming more friendly to disabled people and, and that, but um, when I was there 20 years ago, it was not a friendly place for anyone who wasn't just normal, right? Um, or, you know, achieving a lot. So this is the picture of the Nagasaki mushroom cloud, and you can see, actually it was taken from from a plane, right? This was the plutonium bomb. It rode on the boxcar, uh, which was a B, another B-29. So Nagasaki was actually a secondary target. The reason they placed these bombs so close together is because the, uh, the weather forecast was going to preclude that they wouldn't be able to get in again for like another week. Okay, there was a big storm coming in. And so they went and the first target that they had, they couldn't see. And so they flew this target, and they couldn't see it either. And finally, there was a break in the fog and the clouds, and they dropped it. 
Okay, so <clears throat> about 200,000 people were there. They had already partially evacuated the city um, for for reasons, uh, you know, military reasons. It was about a 40% greater blast than Hiroshima. But the terrain here is a little bit differently, so you have some, um, it's not as, apparently it's not as flat as it was in Hiroshima. And so there were pockets where the bomb would come down and it would, it would hit and, you know, as, as it wouldn't follow the, the terrain of the, the hills and that. Okay. So the geography actually saved some, but the damage there was still, um, astronomical. So were these bombs designed to explode above the city? Yes. They, <clears throat> they were hoping that they would explode above the city. They weren't even sure if the mechanism to arm the bomb would engage. So they were just hoping that they would blow, whether it be above the city or on the ground. Okay, so um, world. this is the World War II Memorial, and this is on the National Mall, which I don't know if you know the National Mall, but you have on one end the Lincoln Memorial, you have the Vietnam, you have the Lincoln, the Reflecting Pool, the Vietnam, the Korean, World War II, you have the mall with the grass, and the Smithsonian's, the White House, Smithsonian's, National Archives, and all this other kind of stuff. Um, and then at the end, you have the Capitol. And across the street from the Capitol is the Supreme Court. Okay? So, make a line in your, in your head, take and, and, uh, make a long, long rectangle. And you, you have the National Mall in that. So, the Pacific, is on the Jefferson Memorial side, and the Jefferson is actually uh, further over. It's in the tidal pool, so it's kind of off of the. It's on the Potomac River, really, um, further off the mall. And you have other miscellaneous ones there, uh, but these are the big ones. What are those the pillars represent each state. Well, sorry. And so at the bottom of these, you can see the states. This is the European side, okay? So we were in, whoop, sorry. So as we look toward the Pacific side of the memorial, um, you can see the different pillars and they're taken, gosh, I keep going the wrong direction. Um, this is, Excuse me, taken from the Europe side of the memorial. Alaska is on this side of the memorial. You can see the Washington Monument, of course, and you can actually see one of the Smithsonian's, the castle, um, from this direction. So each uh, pillar had the name of a state or territory. There's, we're sitting next to Puerto Rico. And I think we're, we're not very far from here. Because we took a picture of that, of course. All right, any questions? Okay, moving on as we head into uh, <clears throat> the Cold War. Who can give me a description of the Cold War? A lot of spies. Basically, an arms race the U.S. and Russia. Very good, Nicholas. Yes, it was an arms race between the U.S. and Russia. There were a lot of spies. Wasn't that exactly war shooting each other? But it was... It was war. It, it was war. And the more I read and study on the Cold War, how fascinating it is. Because there were so many facets of the Cold War that you never hear about, you never read about. Um, you know, it's it's intrigue, right? It's a lot of it is intrigue, and so this picture um, on the cover is the 
It was a picture of the 38th parallel. Where is the 38th parallel? Exactly. North and South Korea. Okay, so the Cold War. How long did we deal with the Cold War in the United States? Till Russia fell. You're right. Okay. Are we still dealing with the Cold War? Yes, we are. Okay. Because you're still dealing with issues that developed during the Cold War. Right? And countries that developed. And uh, foreign policy that was developed. And what else can I tell you that isn't... Yeah, the Iron Curtain. Um, you know, the, the development of Eastern Europe. You look at the EU now and go into Eastern Europe, the former Soviet uh, spheres. Wow. <laughs> you are definitely going back in time, at least in 2009, and I'm sure it hasn't changed much. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's dramatic. Dramatic. And I have some pictures here to, to show you some of that. So, as we come out of World War II, you have two powerhouses. Who are they? The U.S. and the USSR. So, the U.S. is is termed as being at the apex of its power, right, after World War II? Because we were, we had helped win the war, we were, I mean, we had nuclear bombs. We had the, or the atomic bombs, right? Nobody else had them. Right? So that there gives you a little bit of an edge in the power. You have an economy that the production helped win the war. Okay, so you have all these things. You also have Stalin who beat back the Nazis on this thousand mile front and created, um, had already taken over and was influential in the, um, in the Eastern Bloc countries, right? In his sphere. He'd already set up puppet governments in a lot of them, right? Because he wasn't going to do this again. Yeah, you know, 20 million people. Well, but in, in some cases, uh, some historians talk about Stalin. I mean, people were expendable because after the war, he killed several million um, by cutting off their food supply in various caucuses uh, that had raised a ruckus. I mean, he was, he was pretty brutal, okay? I mean, you could see it prior to the war, during the war, and it didn't change after the war, <laughs> okay? So, two of the uh, more famous characters in the, um, in this anti-communism that was developing was, were Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss. Okay. They went at each other, claimed the other was a communist, claimed that they were giving uh, communist secrets away. Um, they did actually find that Alger Hiss did, uh, was communist and, and was operating a Soviet cell. Okay, So that feeds more of that um, fear, right? He had... Uh, given some of these secrets away, it feeds the fear, it feeds the conspiracy theories of, you know, the, the Soviets are taking over our government, right? But they had done differently things in the government. Um, and you've got this paranoia, so you have uh, probes by senators like Nixon and then Senator Joseph McCarthy, right? probing about uh, communism, and it's this global struggle. So everybody's coming from World War II, everybody's going, oh, we're finally done fighting. Great. We just want to be well. We want to feed our families. We want to rebuild our homes. We want to um, get back to normal life, right? Um, this global struggle that was coming out with this anti-communism, with this, um, these two powers going at one another and, and, uh, 
really kind of testing one another, was um, was developing in the United States a stop communism thought pattern, and in the USSR it still was an expansion thought pattern. Right? Let's we're going to expand our uh, our influence. We're going to keep expanding our influence. Okay, and you have an alliance that they had built, and FDR knew it was a tenuous alliance to begin with because all he wanted to do was get through the war and and, and end the war, right? Uh, so that alliance fell apart, of course, after World War II, and this power vacuum, which always, almost always leads to a transition with governments, okay, this big power vacuum, especially in Eastern Europe, and then Western Europe. But then think of the colonies. You still have colonial empires, right? Think Britain. What about their colonial empire? What about France and their colonial empire, right? And the Dutch and, and all these that you've, you've studied, and think of that those empires, right? So these are starting to crumble because uh, they were fighting ahead of time. They were fighting during the war. But they were also going to take advantage of the fact that these empires were not as strong as they once were, right? They had lost millions of people. They had lost millions of dollars. They were having some... It, it, they weren't as strong, okay? So as you develop this polarization and this cold... As this polarization and, and, and that... Um, expands, you've got the uh, the destiny of especially Poland, which is at the heart of the strife between the U.S. and the USSR. Because the USSR, Poland has been invaded now how many times? Just in the last few years. Yeah. Yes, but from the West, Stalin had been hit through Poland twice, right? World War One, World War Two, right? He's like, I am not doing that again. Done. Okay, so it was critical for him to create this, uh, to keep Poland under his sphere of influence, okay? The U.S. Um, did not want to be seen as being soft, on communism, but they also um, wanted to make sure that uh, Poland had free elections, okay? There weren't any free elections that had been promised at the Yalta Accords, okay? So things that had been promised and agreed upon were now being broken already, okay? Right after World War II. So <clears throat> that was violating this national self-determination that um, FDR and Truman later had worked so hard to attain. Okay? And it betrayed democracy. And it was this communist aggression. It was seen as this communist aggression in the U.S. Okay? So, as Truman and Stalin are, are coming at, another, at one another in Poland, you also have Stalin who um, had set up puppet governments in Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, uh, Communist governments in Albania and Yugoslavia. All right, so uh, you have you have these things that are going on that may or may not be acceptable to some of the parties that have been involved. All right, so here is a great slide of the decolonization of Africa and Asia from 47 to 99, okay? So, a lot of these co countries had been really divided by the colonizers. So, the, um, and I'll pick on Britain, say, say Britain, okay? Great Britain. They would come in and they would draw the line of where their new territory was wasn't necessarily a historic line. It wasn't necessarily a line that um, was 
made a lot of sense beside the fact that it was a territory that they decided to draw the line here, okay? Um, and so as Britain and France and the Allied nations are really not ready or willing to fight after 1945, and this self-rule was, was um, applied after, or during the war, okay? Um, in 1945, you have 51 nations signing the UN Charter. And by 65, you have um, over 71 new nations, right? So Britain and the U.S. were willing, after a while, and remember Churchill, he didn't, he didn't want to win the war and lose the British Empire. Okay, that was one of his... Um, goals of winning the war and but Britain was not willing to fight as much for their empire okay France however wasn't willing to give up as easily as Britain and the United States and you can see that because of Indochina all right so you've got the Iron Curtain has everyone heard of the Iron Curtain Okay, so the Iron Curtain, was it a wall? Was it a curtain? Was it, what was it? It was like a hypothetical curtain of influence that limited Okay. Robin, Nicholas, did you have something? No. Okay. Uh, so wasn't it, isn't it because of communism? Yes, it's definitely because of communism. You have uh, Stalin tightening his grip on Eastern Europe as the U.S. is trying to assert their power. And so he's closing this trade with the United States. Okay, so it's like an iron curtain comes down and you are no longer, you no longer have any contact with some of these nations. Okay, they are fully under um, the sphere of Stalin. Okay. Yes, yes, it did create a lot of tension. What a great word. Thank you. It is a great word, Aiden. Right. So, you have containment. Containment. Okay, you think of containment, you think, I'm going to keep it. Okay, so, one of the ways that the U.S. responded to this Iron Curtain, which was coined by Churchill, um, one of the ways to do that was to um, contain the USSR where they already were, not allow them to go elsewhere, not allow them to take over, be the aggressor in any other nations, right? Or to spread the communism that they were trying, that they were implementing in some of the nations now where they had this sphere of influence. George Kennan, George F. Kennan, right, a U.S. diplomat who came out with the, what was first termed the X article, was key to us and the foreign policy for the United States for years afterwards. Okay? Um, and his take on Stalin and, and Russia and Russian politics is what was the basis of the U.S. foreign policy of containment. Okay? Um, you know, don't let Stalin steamroll and go wherever he wants. Be uh, Don't let him be the only aggressor. You must stand up to... Um, him. And Churchill, as he's terming the Iron Curtain, Churchill's asking for an alliance of uh, of the English-speaking peoples, the Anglo-American uh, peoples, to keep that from expanding. Okay? And uh, as as uh, as we continue on, of course, Russia develops atomic and nuclear energy and bombs, right? And so you start this arms race and you're developing these, you are 
you are pumping millions of dollars into this kind of an effort, right? So the um, you have the National Security Act of 47, but the Truman Doctrine was important with granting $400 million in military aid to France and Turkey in containment, for containment. Okay? We were fighting the communist influence and we were fighting the communists. Okay? And as they, as they term it, you know, as they're, as he's wanting to garner support for this, it becomes a, uh, an ideological struggle. Okay? Freedom and liter liberty versus oppression and terror. Okay, as how it was seen and propagated in the United States and from the other side, right? Um, and so the United States with the Truman Doctrine, which is a, a really important doctrine, where the U.S. would support free people everywhere, okay? So basically becoming a global police nation, right? Starting with Greece and Turkey to keep them non-Soviet. Um, and you have the Marshall Plan, right? You have the Marshall Plan, which was a European recovery plan. It was for um, economic development in Europe. They see hunger and poverty and uh, desperation spawning communism. All right? Uh, Greece and Turkey, they were at this time pretty poor their you know their economy was bad you know they were looking for an answer what was germany doing at the beginning of world before world war 2 they were they were looking for an answer right so truman and marshall um, comes up with this plan to send in aid send in money <clears throat> if people's basic needs are met, and you know you have a higher in um, in life, there's a hierarchy of needs, right? Safety, and you're messing with the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, safety and shelter are. <laughs> Somebody's messing with the camera. Okay, safety and shelter are. Two of those basic needs. You meet those needs, and people are not going to be as desperate for different things, right? Okay. Oh, sure was. All right. So, um, by 1952, the Western European economy had increased by 200 percent. It was a dramatic increase, and it worked. Okay. So. That's one of the important things to understand about the Truman and the Marshall. Um, at 124-125. Confrontation in Germany, Berlin Airlift, NATO. Okay, the Berlin Airlift started because Stalin cut off supplies into Berlin, which had been split into um, basically a Soviet. The Allies had split Berlin. Right? And so blockading Berlin meant that the U.S. said, fine, block Berlin. They airlifted. Every few minutes, they would bring in another plane of supplies. Food, water, any supply that you needed. Okay? And um, it happened for like almost a year that the Berlin airlift. He was, uh, Stalin was trying to get the U.S. and Britain out of Berlin, and it didn't work. All right. So, what they did is, uh, in May of '49, the Federal Republic of Germany was basically created by the Allies, and that's what became known as West Germany. And then you have East Germany. <laughs> Thank you. And then you have East Germany. Gosh, that is under um, Stalin, right? And uh, NATO was signed. NATO was signed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, okay, to end um, 
U.S. avoidance of, of entangling the uh, alliances abroad, right? It, it effectively ended that. So we became allies and um, agreed to support the other nations in NATO, right? So in 49, the USSR formed East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. The same year they exploded their first atomic bomb. All right? So the race in the arms race, and you'll hear it later, especially oh, in the 70s and 80s, but especially in the 80s, I remember as a kid the arms race and the Cold War and knowing that at any time you could be bombed. Um, that was just how people were brought up. I mean, I, I was a kid. I remember it and thinking that. Right? So Asia was also part of the Cold War. And the Cold War was still the U.S. and the USSR. And where those communist nations and that sphere of influence was headed. Okay? And you have the Philippines where a pro-communist insurgency had been crushed. But you have Manchuria which was under a, a Russian sphere. You have Japan, which is under the U.S. sphere, right? You have Korea, who was both, it had been partitioned at the 38th parallel, so Russia had the north and the U.S. had the south, right? Um, you had Mao Zedong, who was fighting with nationalist uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Okay, so the nationalists against the communists, the nationalists lost. And this was a huge blow to Truman. It was a huge blow to the U.S., a huge blow to the psyche of this democracy versus uh, communism. Because communism won China, which nobody expected in the U.S. for it to happen. Okay, it was huge. Uh, so the U.S. recognized Taiwan, which is where Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, uh, was, had left and, and had taken over, okay? And if you go to Taiwan, interestingly, they say they are China. Um, so it's not called China, or Taiwan there, it's called China, um, because they believe that it's the, the pro true and proper China. Okay, so <clears throat> as you as you're looking at this in the Cold War, and and that you have to realize how things and how rapidly things are changing, and here's the the post-war. Do, do you have questions? No. Okay, so we're gonna leave off here. Uh, on Tuesday, we'll we continue on Nicholas. And Robin, these guys will be here for, or be gone. Okay, any questions? You see the Iron Curtain? That red line there? And then Albania, which is still part of the Iron Curtain, but it's, um, it's not connected through Yugoslavia? All right, so there's your division of Europe. Budapest. Prague, Berlin, Warsaw, Bucharest, Sofia, um, all of the major capitals there. And then East Berlin and West Berlin.